Hey everyone, this is Bathmetrics, and welcome to episode 14 of Grid School for Bitwig 3.0. Today we're primarily going to be talking about how to synchronize your data sequencers to the transport of the DAW. But this is the first episode where I'm also going to have to start throwing the really hard, mind-bending stuff about phase at you. I've been talking about the basics of phase so far and trying to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> and if you've actually watched episodes 12 and 13 where I first start getting into phase, um, you may think, wait a minute, that was already pretty complex. Well, trust me, that was just the basics. It gets weirder. And so this is going to be a dense video. You're going to have to, there's a lot of things I'm going to throw at you here. Um, so before I get into the video itself, just a quick reminder, all of the episodes build upon concepts and techniques I've, I've explained in earlier episodes. So a lot of the things I say today are going to go right over your head unless you're caught up with us in this series. So you can find a full playlist of all the grid school videos through a link in the description to this video. And I highly recommend you invest the time in catching up to where we are. Or a lot of stuff I say today might, might be confusing to you. Okay, so back in episode 12, where I first started talking about how to do sequencing in the grid, I made a big deal about always running in true mono voice mode for your grid. That was an oversimplification. I did it on purpose just to not have to go down a rabbit hole of all the nuances and weirdness about phase and voices and gates. Today, we can't avoid that anymore. So before I get into the main subject, which is how to synchronize things to the transport, I want to review the bits and pieces I left off about voices, gates, and phase. And I really want you to burn that phrase into your head. Those three things are so tightly interrelated into anything that has to do with the grid, especially if you're using data sequencers. Voices, gates, and phase all interact with each other in very interesting and sometimes confusing ways. The easiest way to avoid the confusion is to just build your grid devices in true mono mode, because most of the time that prevents you from having to think or worry about some of the confusing interactions that can happen. But in the interest of making sure you, you know, have, have good concepts and techniques and troubleshooting ideas to work with, I'm going to talk about some of the weirdness around the interaction between voices, gates, and phase right now. So the first problem is that, like I, like I tried to explain in the last video, in the grid, you pretty much need a voice that's alive for phase to run inside of. And of course, data devices need to be driven by phase. So data devices aren't going to work unless there's some phase running through the grid. If you look at this, I just opened up this project and I haven't touched a thing yet. I haven't touched a single key on my keyboard. I haven't played the transport. I haven't done anything. Nothing has woken this, this grid device up. You can see that this purple dot isn't filling up with phase. You can see that this grid, uh, this sequencer, this data sequencer isn't moving, right? There's no phase in here. And oddly, you know, I've clicked on the header of the device and I'm looking at the voice handling for the grid device and we're in true mono mode, but hey, why is this zero? Isn't this supposed to be one over one? Doesn't true mono always keep a voice alive? Okay, so here's the first thing to understand. If you've got a saved project, and you open it up and you go into a grid device in your project, nothing's happening until you sort of wake it up and create a voice, okay? It's fine if it's just a basic synthesizer that you manually play because the minute you play this gate, everything starts running. But the point I'm making is phase by default isn't running until you trigger some sort of incoming MIDI note that rolls into the grid and wakes it up. It's not strictly a gate, it's more like an event hits the grid and wakes it up and starts making phase move through it. So watch what happens when I touch a MIDI note. Watch right here. The minute I touch a MIDI note, I've woken it up, True Mono has created a voice, and now because it's True Mono, it's keeping that voice alive. And because we have a voice that's alive now, phase is running, and you can see the phase dot filling up. You can see the phase flowing into this data device, and now data's moving through, the, the sequence of the phase is moving through the um, pitches device. 
And we can see uh, on an oscilloscope that we have phase running. And let's open this up and let's make this slower. All right. So let's do an interesting thing. I'm going to come over here and open up a different project for a minute. Well, this is the meat of, our, of, our, of this video, but we'll come back to this. So I've activated the audio engine for this project. I'm going to come back to this one that's been deactivated and activate the audio engine again. So it's like I just opened it up. And again, you can see there's no phase running. There's no, no dot filling up. There's nothing on the oscilloscope. It's just dead. If we go to the voice handling for the grid, we're in true mono, but there's no voice. So again, I'm really trying to drive home. Voices are the processing threads in which everything happens. And if a voice isn't alive, phase isn't happening, nothing's happening. All you have to do to wake up a device that's in this state is just tap, you know, send any kind of MIDI signal right. into the grid and you'll wake it up. And now we have phase. So that's the first thing to, to bear in mind. Now, the next thing to bear in mind is that gates interact with each other and override each other. Right now, I don't have a gates uh, data device in here. This is just pitches. This is the only sequencer that's happening. And my envelopes are going to be triggered by this uh, gate precord here on the envelope. So if I hold down a key, this is C3. We can hear that these MIDI semitones are modifying the C3. If I hold down a C4, it's going to be a C4 at the center point, and these are going to be modifying the C4. If I hold down a C2, if I hold down a G2, and so on. So the point is, it's this envelope that is uh, this gate on the envelope device that's just basically taking the voice up to full amplitude. And it's just staying there for as long as I hold the note down. And so then we're having the sequenced data uh, from the pitches device modifying the incoming key. Now, if I bring in a gates device and I try to hook this into the grid, we're going to add some complexity here because in essence, all the gates in a grid device can conflict with each other, or better stated, they can override each other. Sort of like whichever gate is active takes precedence. So if I were to hook up the, let's do it this way, let's hook this up and turn off the phase cords so that these are running at the same phase with each other. And then let's take the output of the gates module and have the gates module triggering the envelope. Now, where's our sound? The gate is triggering gates, but where's where's the sound? Well, again, I had to kind of wake up the gates module. Let's try that again. Let's make sure you really caught that. I'm going to delete this. Let's get rid of you. And now everything's being manually triggered by one gate here. As soon as I let go of the gate, the envelope stops, even though a sequencer is running. Let's bring in the gates module one more time and hook it up. I'm going to take this reset up to here, turn this off so that it's all taking its phase input from this one right here. You can see that these are in sync. You can see that this is an on gate, off gates. It should be triggering these MIDI pitches in this way. And if I turn off this pre-chord and hook up this gate to trigger the envelope, it's working, right? Because this pre-chord was off. And if I press keys on my keyboard, we can see that every time I press a key, it's, it's restarting the phase because of this thing right here. If I turn this off so that reset isn't being re-triggered by incoming notes that I'm pressing on my controller. Now, if I press notes, it doesn't affect this. I'm pressing notes all over my controller. And it's not affecting the gates, but it is affecting the pitch, because this is still listening to the pitch of incoming notes right here. So if I press a C3, 
The pattern's now going to be based on C3 in the middle. If I press a C4, now this is based on C4 in the middle. And some of these are so high that they're like not registering. Here's C2. Right? And because these are off, let's turn all these on so you can hear them all. C4, C2, G2, and so on. Um, but if I do this again, let's delete this. There, delete. Let's unhook everything again. Turn this on so that it's just being manually driven. So manually driven as I hold a note down. Now I'm going to leave this gate on, this incoming gate on. And there's the last note that I played, a C3. I'm going to bring in the gates module. I'm going to hook it up to the phase. Hook it up down here. All right. And turn this off. All right. In this case, it's working. But you will find that in some cases, like that very first time I pulled this in and hooked it up, um, let's, let's stop you for a minute. When I first brought it in, it wasn't actually running. So sometimes when you bring in a new data device and hook it up to the phase, you still might have to sort of kick it a little bit with a, an incoming MIDI note, especially if it's a Gates device. You might have to kick it to get it like recognized by the grid and, and actually generating outputs. Uh, and it's, oh gosh, this is so confusing. It's kind of depends whether or not this will trigger correctly, kind of depends on exactly when you hook it up because, mm, let's see, how can I explain this? If all these gates were off, and let's activate this. If I unhook this, and let's make maybe like, like the last two gates active. Now, this time I'm going to hook it up to phase when the phase is in the first half of things. I'm waiting to actually connect it there. Okay. So when I connected it, it was in an off state. The gate corresponding to the time I connected it was in an off state. And if I connect this over to the envelope, when it's also in an off state, let's see if I can make this happen. There we go. All right, well, this time it's triggering, but <laughs> there are times when it won't trigger. And you saw that happen the very first time I dragged this in. And if that happens, just press a note and it'll start running. Okay, so anyway, um, the next thing to note is that these gates will override each other. We've got gates being generated by this thing, and we've got gates being generated if I manually hold down a key right here. So, if I were to turn, let's see, turn that one off too. So this is all we hear from this gates module. But if I hold down a key, you can hear that this gate from being held down was overriding these gates. And sometimes you might want that. Sometimes that's desired behavior. But it's happening because we're in true mono mode. So there's always a voice active. So the phase is always running. So this is always running. And these two things don't really conflict with each other because we're not triggering or creating a new voice out from scratch. It's just kind of playing with gates on the same voice. But now let's go into Digimono. No more voices. So phase is still operating because we woke up the grid, but there's nothing for these things to run inside of, right? If I hold down a key, we have a voice active now. As soon as I let go of a key and the voice is released, everything here stops because data sequencers and, and pretty much the phase that runs through data sequencers needs a voice to live inside of.
Now, if I turn off this key so that now pressing incoming keyboard notes doesn't um, trigger anything, watch what happens. It's going to get real interesting now. I press a key, nothing mm. happens. I press a key, oh, we heard something, and then it stopped. I'm still holding the key down. See these yellow notes right here? MIDI notes are still hitting the grid. I'm still holding that key down. Let's try it again. I'm going to hold the key again. Nothing happens. I'm going to hold the key again. Nothing happens. Again. Mm -hmm. Again. And there we had two blips, and then it stopped. What the hell is going on here, right? This confused the hell out of me when I first ran into it, but when I started thinking about how voices, phase, and gates interact with each other, it started making sense. Let's explain what's happening here. The phase is still running. See this dot right here? Let's get a oscilloscope up. Just really make this clear. The phase that's driving the two data modules is active kind of, sort of, but it's only active in one place. Look closely at this dot. This dot is not filling up. But if I hook up this dot, we still don't see phase. Now, what the hell's going on here? You can see the dot filling up. You can see that if I select this device, you can see the phase is coming out of it according to the grid. If I, if I select the reset device, you can see the, the phase here is coming out. Oh, but this is interesting. This is the signal coming in from the device phase input. But look at what's coming out of the reset, right? And even though I have device phase coming into this device here, it's kind of sort of not really affecting the oscilloscope either. So what's going on here? And again, this is where this interaction between voices and phase come into play. I don't have the manual pre-chord on, but if I hold down a key, right, we still don't see anything happening. But watch what happens if I keep tapping a key until it finally syncs up with one of these three gates that are on. It blipped for a second. Did you see this blip? And then it stopped. Let's slow this down so you can really see it. Okay, Tapping a key, I get a little tiny trigger that lasts for a second and then shuts off. Because for a second, the voice is active. Right? And even though I'm holding the voice down and Digimono is active, it's still only triggering for just an instant. The phase, literally, is triggering for an instant. But if I finally hit a key in time with how the phase is still effectively running through here under the covers, we get a little bit of a phase line. And it'll stay alive until it hits the next off gate. And then the off gate effectively kind of kills the voice. I mean, the voice is still alive because I'm holding the key down, but the gate kind of killed off the voice inside this. So this is confusing. This is kind of counterintuitive. And the main thing to remember is if the only thing creating gates in your project is an automatic gates module from data, even though phase is technically running and you can see the phase running, right? Certain devices aren't going to be responding to phase, and this reset device shows it the most clearly. We have normal phase going from 0 to 1, coming out of the phase input because the device is awake. But the, the reset is just sort of, this is the phase out coming out of the reset, and it's just at this flat line value. If I tap a key for a minute, we get a little bit of phase out. For as long as a gate triggers or some little blip happens and the phase value is equal to the, the total amplitude at the time it's triggered, and then it just stays there. It doesn't keep moving up and resetting and up and resetting. The reset module is kind of dependent on a gate to let phase operate normally and flow out of it. And it's a similar deal with the oscilloscope. The oscilloscope is really meant to see a signal that's moving, but there's no moving signal right now. And it's not, if I hook this up here to this one, right? It's just not really responding because there's no gate holding a, um, a signal open. There's no audio. This is really kind of effectively an audio device 
because its outputs are red, which means it's an audio signal. So unless I've got a gate open, it's got nothing to really show us because it's really meant mm -hmm. to look at audio, not to look at phase. It's just kind of useful that we can look at phase like it were an audio signal if it were actually being constantly output and constantly moving, mm -hmm. right? So this is going to confuse the heck out of you. If I fill all these in, it's a different story. The minute I touch a key, it's going to start running and looking normal. Even when I let go of the key, I'm not holding a key now. Let me stop this by just killing it off, right? Start it again. And again, nothing's happening. But as soon as I press a key, and I'm just going to tap it this time, everything is running normally. Why? Well, it's running normally because these gates are constant and the timeout after the envelope quits isn't enough to effectively kill off the voice and, and the open notes that are coming in the system. There's just constant signal running and the gates are staying open. But as soon as I shut a few of these off, the voices stop. Again, because I'm in Digimono. So we, what we're seeing here is this strange, sometimes confusing interaction between the voice mode, whether or not gates are active, and for how long they're active or inactive, and the phase, right? This is the weirdest stuff you're going to run into. And again, you can avoid all this by just running in true mono. Because true mono, a voice stays alive and keeps running. And so, you know, everything just keeps working. Right? But as soon as I go back to Digimono and it hits the first gate off, everything stops. Phases, gates, and voices all have to be like alive somehow to make sequencers run in the grid. That's the main thing I want to show you. Now, the last little nuance is this. Let's delete this. Oh, damn it. Didn't mean to delete the whole thing. Um, let's delete you. And let's delete you, let's unhook you, and let's go back to here. Now, there is a time when you can do polyphonic stuff with data sequencers. And the key is you can't have anything being triggered by the gates module. Because again, gates conflict with each other. They override each other. They overwrite each other. If the only gates in your entire build are the normal types of gates on an envelope, whether you're using the gate pre-cord here, or whether you've grabbed uh, a gate in from the I.O. section and manually hooked that up to an envelope and maybe done some interesting things in the middle, you know, somehow or another, you need to have a, a kind of manually gated build without any kind of automatic gates being generated by a data generator. When that's the case, you can now do polyphonic stuff. You can even do true mono stuff. So our Digimono stuff. So I'm in Digimono mode, but because Digimono just responds to whether, you know, when a gate is open, it creates a voice. I'm holding the key down so the voice stays alive. So everything runs like we would expect. We've got phase, we've got movement, the whole nine yards. As soon as I let go of the gate, the voice dies. Things stop running because we don't have a gate, phase, and voice active. All three of those have to be active for sequencers to run. Okay. Now, if I go into polyphonic mode, again, because there's only one type of gate affecting the build and the gate stays open as long as I'm holding keys down, well, now I can get polyphonic behavior. You can hear that I've got three different voices active and I should be seeing three lines here. I'm kind of surprised I'm not seeing three lines here. Let's try something. There we go. So you can see the three voices moving through here. And the reason that they were separated out and we saw them is because of the reset behavior here. What this says is every new incoming note resets the phase of the thing I'm feeding into. So the first note resets the phase and starts from the beginning. 
And then the second note after that resets the phase and starts at the beginning, while the first note just keeps moving, because it's only the newest note that resets the phase each time. And if I manage to hit two notes at the same time, when they both wrap around to the start point, then they just operate in phase together. But here's three notes that are clearly separated. Okay. If I turn this tr reset off, and now it's not going to reset, then every single new note I add, every new voice I add, is going to share the same step or phase, uh, the same, the same phase, so. Four voices, right? So you can do polyphonic stuff. The behavior of the polyphony is gonna depend on whether or not you're using a reset device on the phase to like make each new note re-trigger from the beginning of the phase and start a new phase. Uh, and it's interesting if we hook up an oscilloscope to this and look at what's coming out of the reset. Oh, stop that. Let's really drag this out. Let's make this slow. So here's the first note. And let's go back into re-triggered mode. Okay, watch what happened here. First note, second note. Third note. So the point is, what comes out of the reset device is always the most recent phase reset I've done. It only shows one phase at a time. So it's like your phase gets sent into here, and then this remembers that phase for the first voice. But then the second voice is creating a new processing thread. And because we have this reset behavior, the new processing thread has starting its phase from a different point. And then the third voice creates a third new processing thread. And because this reset button is on, it creates a new phase for the third one. And then the output of this is just showing you whatever the most recent phase reset was. Okay. But this all works, and we get polyphony, and the voices stay alive, whether they're sharing the same phase or each voice is resetting its own phase, because we're just holding down one gate. There's only one gate in the project. The minute you bring this thing in, all bets are off, and you have to start asking yourself why things aren't interacting the way you expect. And in most cases, if this is in a build, just remember the only thing that's probably going to work predictably and reliably is true mono mode because there's just one voice and it keeps the voice alive. Okay, so that's the catch up from episode 12 and 13 with the weird interactions between phase and gate. Let's get on to the subject of today's video, which is really about how to sync your data sequencers to the play transport. And you know, the reason I had to go into these details is because they affect the way the transport synchronization works. So let's go over here and start this project. And there are two different use cases and two different basic patterns you need to use depending on whether or not your phase is free running or not. So now I have to bring a new wrinkle in I haven't showed you before, which is this button right here. Uh, on the polygrid device, the same place where all the voice handling stuff is. In the device phase, I had talked about how to use it to set the length of the phase that's being run through the device. But there's this little button right here, and it does something really interesting. You'll notice it's unchecked. Everything I've showed you before has always had this button enabled. And when I enable it, watch what happens in the grid. Well, actually, we don't have any voices on, so let's just um. tap a note to wake up true mono, and now we have a voice active. So if I click the button to let it, it free run when stopped, when what stopped? Well, when the transport has stopped. You'll notice transport is not running up here. So as soon as I turn this on, but when I turn it off, the transport stopped. 
So there's no phase. So nothing's happening because there's no phase, even though a voice is alive. And even though every single gate that's being automatically generated here is on. So voice is alive, gates are alive, but phase isn't alive. And it isn't alive because this controls whether or not the device phase actually runs, whether uh, the transport is running or not. So what do we mean by when the transport's running? In your arranger timeline, you're always locked up to a bar beat kind of grid. And if it's playing... If it's not playing, well, transport isn't running, and so the grid is stopped. And the grid stopped because of this button here. So this basically says only run phase into the grid when the transport's moving. Uh. Right? Now, if you if you if you're paying close attention, you'll notice some weirdness about this very first note each time I start the transport. Um and this is a just, I don't know if it's a bug. I don't know if it's avoidable. I don't know if it's unavoidable. Um, it's just something to be aware of. When you start and stop the transport, it's not an abrupt instant stop. Bitwig effectively smooths it out. Uh, this is a, a thing we run into with automation lanes and like trying to do gated automation where you're completely turning off the volume for a device. A lot of volume knobs uh, and things in every DAW, they will all do some degree of smoothing to abrupt changes in amplitude because otherwise you get pops and clicks and sometimes they can be nasty. Sometimes they can damage your speakers if you're running too much power through your speakers. So the DAW manufacturers build a certain degree of smoothing in to almost any action that abruptly changes amplitude. So certainly starting and stopping your play transport is abruptly changing amplitude. If they just like lopped it off like a brick wall and you went from zero to full volume in a loud drop or something and your speakers were turned up loud enough, you could ruin your speakers, right? So they don't, they don't do that. They bring it up slow. They ramp it up. There's a soft little fade in and fade out every time you start and stop the sequencer. So... When you're not using a, a manual keyboard gate, there's nothing in here. This, this gate pre-chord is off. This gate pre-chord is off. There's absolutely nothing driving any envelopes except for this gates module and the phase that's running into the gate. So when you start and stop the transport, there's a tiny, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, I don't know how long, millisecond kind of fade up and fade down time. And you're going to hear that when I start and stop a lot through, even though every single gate is on, you're going to hear some notes kind of lag out a little bit and slow down almost when I stop. And sometimes when I start, you're going to hear this first note, which is always the lowest one, won't fire. Like the amplitude won't even really hit until we're already in the second eighth note on this gate here. Watch, I'm going to just turn the playhead up, the play transport on and off. See, we didn't hear that first low note. We should be hearing a that low note. That's the start of every bar. And let me, let me actually do this in a different mode so you can see the play transport at the same time. Oops, damn it, not control D, shift D. All right, let's get a pop out window. So just watch the grid here, watch the play head up here. Um. Okay, did you hear that weird slowdown? Because <laughs> it I moved the play head, but the transport wasn't running, so it just played and then stopped, but it kind of like slowed down like a DJ deck or, or a turntable. All right, and I'm going to press play on and off quite a few times with my um, space bar. Watch here, watch here, and listen, and particularly listen for this low note. I'm going to let it run. See, we didn't hear it, but uh, down. 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 After the, the play has the play transport has fully spun up to speed and we start hitting the downbeats of each new bar, 
of bars two, three, and four, then this low note always successfully plays. Watch one more time. Downbeat. 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 Okay. But sometimes I'm going to start and stop it a lot inside the first bar and watch how quite a lot of the time it's going to skip that first lowest note when I start it. Didn't play at that time. Didn't play at that time. Didn't play at that time. There, that time it played it. What's going on? Again, it's because the transport has to be running in order to get the phase happening. There's no phase right now. If I bring in the oscilloscope, or trusty oscilloscope, and let's set this to be slow, and let's hook it up. Let's make it a little bigger so we can see the phase. This is an interesting view. What's going on with the phase line? It's not at zero, it's just sitting here. And if we look at the output of the phase device, well, it's, it's above zero, but it's not moving from zero to one and then back to zero to one. It's not acting like phase. But if I play my transport and I stop it, it just freezes on wherever the phase cycle was when I stopped the transport. In fact, it's frozen at this point in its cycle. The full cycle goes from bar the start of the downbeat of each bar to the very end of each bar and then resets at the downbeat of the next bar. So we're about a little more than midway through the cycle right here. And so this just froze just a little bit above the halfway mark. If I start it again, it's gonna reset from the beginning because this is where my play start marker is. And because there's a bit of a spin up time to get up to speed once it's restarted, we sometimes are skipping this first note because the, the phase isn't really fully locked in and running at the right speed. Sometimes, until maybe by the time it's hit the second eighth note of the transport. See, it just didn't pop in. That time it did. That time it didn't. That time it didn't. That time it didn't. No. There, that time it did, right? So where I'm going with this is, if you're going to be syncing up synchronizers to play transport so that you can have a synchronizer running in the background of your song as all your other tracks are doing specific things and you're worried about everything being locked to tempo, just be really, really aware that wherever you're starting your playhead from, there's going to be a little bit of a lag potentially on the first one or two depending on the speed of your of your data devices, you're just going to miss that first note sometimes when you first start up the playhead. But once it's rolling at speed, it'll be normal from that point on. So, you know, maybe what you want to do if you really want to count on this sequence always working by the time you get later on in a project and you're trying to finish things out and you're in mixing and mastering, maybe you want to bounce this thing to audio and just cut out whatever happened in bar one when you first started the transport and just kind of make your audio loops out of this so that it's just always 100% sure this first thing will fire. Again, just something to be aware of. I don't know, maybe somewhere down the road, Bitwig will tighten that up and make it work better, but I kind of suspect it would involve making grid devices have some latency to them, so maybe it's not possible. Just understand that today, that's how it works. Um, now, the other interesting thing is if I have my playhead set to start from a different position. Now, again, just moving, moving my, my play start position to the middle of a bar, to the middle of the phase, has instantly moved my phase line up here. And every time I start and stop transport now, it's going to start in the middle of the pattern because I'm starting literally in the middle of the phase. <laughs> I'm stopping it right here at the bottom, but when I start it, it's going to jump up to the center point. Again, starting, it jumps to center point. I've stopped almost at the top of the cycle, but as soon as I start transport again, it's going to start from right here at the middle. If I set this placed marker to the third beat, see it's jumped up here, and this is where everything's going to start each time I hit the playhead. Run. 
Okay, so this should give you an idea of how the relative position of your playhead start within a cycle, a bar, because the phase always runs from bar start to bar end. Uh, and it's, it runs at the speed of your project tempo. When you're in this mode where free run when stopped is unchecked, it's always completely locked to the position of your playhead marker on the grid. And depending on where you start your playback is where the pattern's going to start playing. And this this will be locked. So if for whatever reason you start playback here, the pattern is still 100% in lockstep with your grids. This is always going to occur on the downbeat of a new bar. And this is always going to occur on the downbeat of the second. I'm sorry, this one will always start. <laughs> no, this one will always start on the downbeat of your um, or the backbeat of each bar, right? At, at beat number three of each bar. Um, so let's look at this more zoomed out again and show you the rest of this basic pattern. So the basic idea here is we don't need a phase reset of any sort because the phase itself is locked to the position of the arranger grid. So you don't need a phase reset when this button is off. It's, it just won't do any good, really. And then the way the rest of this is working, of course, is that the gates are controlling when the sampler fires. So the, the pre-chord that would normally wait for my keyboard input like this and fire, it, it just doesn't need to be on. It should probably be off. And since these are controlling the pitches, uh, we typically want this off. And then, you know, the gates themselves are also triggering the, um, the envelope itself. And then here's the output of the sampler going out. All right, so this is your basic pattern if you are not free run when stop. Now, if we instead have, oops, let's go back here and turn this off so it won't bother us. And let's come here and turn this one on. And again, because of this half moon symbol, this has been asleep for a long time. And so if we look at the voices, even though we're in true mono, it's just asleep. So let's tap a note and wake it up. Um, oops, it helps if I actually activate that channel. If I tap a note now and send it into this grid, it wakes up and turns bright. It's no longer asleep. Phase is running because we have true voice, and so we have voices active, we have phase active, and we have gates active. Now, the difference here is I have free run when stopped, so the phase is constantly running once this thing is awake. It's constantly outputting gates, the gates are constantly triggering the sampler. We have no sound because uh, of this logic gate that basically says both the transport have to be running and I need to be getting gated signals or some other signal in this bottom port to actually send anything out to trigger this one. So it's seeing all the gates and they're blipping right here, but because this is not yet true, this won't let these signals pass, okay? So if we turn on transport, and we turn off transport, and we turn on transport, and watch what's happening over here. When this becomes true, because transport is on, this also becomes true, and so now this signal gets to flow through the AND gate. So that's one of the basic things you have to do if free run and stop, because it'll drive you crazy if you just if you don't use this kind of gate and this is constantly free running and making noise. It's going to drive you crazy. So this is a really simple design pattern to deal with that. Um, the other thing that's going on here is whenever the transport starts and this turns true, it's feeding into the trigger of the reset and it's resetting the phase of this device. Watch what happens when I start it when the phase is way over here. It still goes to the beginning. I'm turning, I'm using my space bar to turn play transport on and off. Okay. It's always going back and resetting because every time this triggers true, it's a trigger to do the reset of the phase. Now that brings up an interesting point. Let's uh, bring this down. 
And let's do the thing where we pop it out and look at the uh, play scale at the same time. So let's put my playhead marker here. When I start transport, we can hear the low note is still happening on the downbeat of each new bar. This is perfectly synced with the grid, but it's only synced because I'm starting my playback on the on the arranger grid itself, or the arranger timeline. I'm starting it at the downbeat of a bar. So this is resetting so that this is also occurring where the downbeat of the bar was always occurring in my last episode and my last example that wasn't free running. But watch what happens if I put my cursor, my play start here. This is still free running. It doesn't care that I'm in the middle of the phase. Uh, the phase is just constantly rotating through. And because this is set to restart or reset the phase from the beginning of the pattern, the minute I press the play bar and this turns true, even though I'm in the middle of my bar, of my grid up here in the arranger, it's going to start the pattern from the very beginning. And now the downbeat of the pattern is in the middle of each bar. Right there, that low note. And if I move this over here to like this one, it's the same deal. Now I'm starting on the fourth beat of the first bar, and that's where the downbeat of the pattern is. So the point is, when you're working in this mode that is free run when stopped, and you're using reset triggers to set where your pattern is, Suddenly, your pattern can become out of sync with your project, depending on where exactly you're starting the playback each time. So if you're going to use this type of sequencer, and you've got a whole bunch of other tracks, drum beats and stuff working in time with this, and you expect this note to be on the downbeat of every bar, then you have to pay attention to where you're starting your playback from, and you need to always start from the beginning of a bar. You need to start on the downbeat of a bar, or else this will be out of sync with your project. Now it's in sync. But if I do this and I start playback from here, it's no longer in sync with my project. Because now the low note the first note, the downbeat of the pattern, is happening on the second beat of you know, every bar, and that's not good. Now, if we don't use a reset, it's a different story. So let's, let's basically just delete this reset. Well, let's just disable it. That should work. So now this pattern is free running, and if I start and stop the playback, it's going to be based on wherever you know, it is in the pattern, like right in the middle. Or is it? Watch. Watch closely. Very end. Hit play. It's always jumping and starting from this position. Why is that? Ah, because of where the playhead is. So the phase is always aware of the project grid, even if it's free running. This is always free running according to the the spacing or cycle of each bar in your project. And so when I start playback from the middle of a bar or the, or the first beat of a bar, because I'm not resetting the phase, it's always going to just naturally find its way to where that cycle of the phase, you know, where we're starting in the phase. And again, we can see this if we put an oscilloscope in. Let's just put it right here, make it nice and big. I'm running at a slow project tempo. Come on. Oh, I'm having mouse problems today. Okay, let's get this phase in here. So there's our phase movement. Let's slow it down. So the phase is moving because we're free running over here. But the minute I start playback, and it starts at this point in my bar pattern, right? You're going to see it start at the second line here above the center line, no matter where I am. Starts at the se second blip. Starts at 
starts at the second blip. Starts at the second blip. See the jump? If I move this over to the fourth bar in the pattern, you're going to see it start up here at this at this line. Okay, so again, reset. Got to understand what it's doing. You got to think about where your phase is in the in the arranger timeline. You have to think about all that stuff when you're trying to set sequencers up. Now, the rest of this pattern is pretty simple to understand for when you're working in this mode where you're trying to um, have a free running phase. Let's get rid of this so it's not confusing us. The basic pattern is you're, you might want to reset or not. If you do have a reset, you want it being reset by the, uh, usually by the whether or not the playhead is actually running, whether transport's running. And again, this is a button you'll find way over on the right-hand side of the I.O. group. Is the transport playing or not? It's yellow because it's a logic module. It's like, is it on? Is it off? True or false? That's why it's yellow. And then you probably want to use this kind of Boolean gate, this, this Boolean logic, to decide whether or not the transport has to be running for the signal to keep flowing through and triggering the envelope. Now, there's one other little nuance here about this AND gate, and it's really a, a matter of personal choice. You'll notice that the gate is running, it's free running, and because the gate's device is free running, it's sending triggers into the sampler, and so the sampler is actually running all the time. It's triggering every time a gate hits. But the sound isn't going anywhere because this is controlling whether or not the envelope is firing with each gate. We could, however, hook it up this way so that this AND is also going into the sampler. And so now the play transport has to be on before the sampler even fires, right? So as soon as I turn the transport on, this is going to control whether or not the sampler is being triggered. <laughs> So you can design this either way. For me, the main thing is always, do I want an envelope triggering or not? And I don't really care if other things are all running all the time under the covers, but you can hook it up this way if you want. It's, it's totally up to you. Uh, if you don't hook it up that way, then of course you need some sort of gate to drive the oscillator or the sampler. <laughs> Okay, so I know I threw a lot at you. This was a complex one, um, but we're a little bit farther along in the subject of phase. I'm going to be throwing a lot more nuances at you in the next two episodes. <laughs> but this was the worst one. This is the one where I had to really get into the, the nitty-gritty details of that crazy interaction between voices, gates, and phase. Anytime you run into trouble... Check what's happening with your voices, gates, and phase, and know that you have to have all three of those happening for sequence devices to be working in a predictable way. All right. Thanks for hanging with me, and I will see you next time.